Priscilla, there we go. Not Priscilla, that's the name you made up. It's Priscilla, all right. Well, I just had a hard time reading that name last week. He was trying, but but I understand. So Priscilla, Priscilla is who we are talking about. Does anyone remember any book that this woman is mentioned in? Anyone at all? The Bible. The Bible. Kings. The Bible. You little tricks for you. That's adorable. Yes, he's making that, 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 uh, that was Hannah's. Somewhere. Hannah's, I'm not taking all the credit. I'm not that. taking the credit. I actually thought we were studying one from a different book today, so I can't say it was the Bible. No, last week we opened up our series on the life of Priscilla, which apparently no one could remember because it was everyone was like, it's so freezing in here, I don't want to do anything. So hopefully it's better in here today. Uh, All right, it doesn't feel too cold. Stop it, son, what you're doing, it ain't cold in here. That, if anything, it's too hot for Jacob. Jacob's the one who comes in here every weekday and puts it at 50 or below. And I'm uh -huh. like, nah, people gonna hate you. Uh -huh. Look at him denying the truth. You better repent now, son, you do it. <laughs> At the same time, you uh -huh. come in with me. Uh -huh. You drop that temperature all the time. So. That is what we talked about. We discussed the life of Priscilla. And so this week we're going to be talking about in depth what the purpose is in her life in different books of the Bible. And so Priscilla's life is what we're talking about this month. And does anyone remember, this is a tough question, what does Priscilla's life show us? It is not the thing on the screen that we discuss. It is a more in-depth sentence. So you ain't going to get this one, but I'm ready. To share the Lord. No. <laughs> you were really close last time you winged it. You remember that one? That was a good one. You like winged it and it was like real close. Do you remember it? Y'all have no idea. You she looks like, she, you no she looks like she's camping, so I'd say she's fasting. She's not even on the screen, son. What do you mean she? <laughs> That's, a camp. That's a tent. That's a tent. Who knows why there's a tent on the screen? Anyone remember? Tents are camp. Because she she makes tents, yes. Yeah, her and her husband are tent makers, along with who? Oh, I would hate that job. No. Paul. Paul. There we go. Paul and Priscilla Quill were tent makers. That is the purpose of Wait, the Wait, she has relations with Paul? No. Well, yes, but not in a marriage way. So she is. I have a relation with Paul, but it's a relationship because they help build what? No. Houses. No. <laughs> they both build tents. Yes, that is true. That's what we just said. But what does she help Paul do outside of the job? Kill. Because all talk about Jesus where? Because I'm about to They help build up the church. That is what they do. They help Paul build up the church. That is where we see Priscilla and Aquila mentioned. Every time we see these two mentioned six times in the New Testament, that is what they're helping Paul do. They build up the church. Here's the part that only Enoch got last week, all right? Who knows, because of the books of the Bible that they're mentioned in, which books they are in because of the church. What books specifically focus on Paul? And building up the church. There are a lot of them, but you only have four options. They're only mentioned in four books. Did you say Paul? Paul in the book, honey. That's that ain't any one. Yes. Acts. There's one. Yes. Keep going. It's not Kings, like you said the first time. It definitely ain't Kings. What what books of the Bible are Priscilla and Aquila mentioned in helping Paul build up the church? Philippians. No, that is that is a good one though. Are you sure it's not John? Come on, Izzy. I am positive it's not John. <laughs> They're not in the gospel. Huh? Ephesians. Ephesians. No. Two of the books begin with a one and a two. Huh? First Corinthians. Second. No. <laughs> second John. Second Kings. No, Wait, this is what second John. Isn't it? No. Second. What is the last book of the Bible Paul ever wrote? Second then he died. It was a letter to oh. Second Timothy and one book left. We have Acts, first we'll Corinthians, start with. Oh, Second Timothy, John and one of the most famous Paul books in the New Testament. Yeah. No. no. It uh, rhymes with uh, Romans. Uh, Romans! <laughs> Look at us go. So <laughs> good. You stay I know, lying exactly Romans. Point. We were going to sit here for a long time. Did you say Romans? Yeah, I totally missed it. I was, I was just too distracted by the King's comment. Yes, those are the four <laughs> books. you good, you good. Those are the four books that Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned in. We have Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, and 2 when did Timothy. Die? Huh? When did Priscilla die? Uh, it doesn't mention that part. It doesn't? Why do you care about her dying? <laughs> Paul died. Yes, he did. And guess what? So did Priscilla. I have no idea when, though. I don't know if they record that. 
Why? And if we do, but if they help make it a church, church, why didn't they both die at the same time? But, but bring a hitman. In. What does this have to do with death? Where are you tying <laughs> these two together? Because I thought they were. I thought they both died. Where does friends. I we help people friends. build the church? They and they help build the church. They, they end must up have died. Up. Like they end up like going separate ways because Paul goes to jail. But they both help build the church. Right, but Paul mm -hmm. goes to jail and dies. Why did Paul go to jail? Oh, you dies think they went with Paul okay, to prison? No, they did not go with Paul to prison, and you'll, you'll see that. Jail? You'll see that. Yeah, why did Paul yeah, go to jail? Go to jail? A different story for a different day. No, Paul, right. Paul went to jail because he literally built churches, mm -hmm. and he was the main teacher. So who are they going to go for? The head guy or the bottom five? Well, everybody. Oh, yeah. No, no, he clearly didn't live in Rome at this day in the shows, but we'll get into that. So. Priscilla and Aquila helped Paul build up the church. And so today we're going to study in depth what that looked like in the very first book we see them appear in, which is the book of Acts. That is the very first thing we're going to look at. So in the book of Acts, Priscilla and Aquila help out Paul begin on his first missionary journey in planting the church. And what's cool about Priscilla's life and what's amazing to see here is that she did not let culture and she didn't let outside forces impact what God wanted her to do. She wasn't someone who was a top tier theologian as we know, she just made tents. She wasn't a top person that Paul went after and said, let me use you to help build up the church. But she also didn't live up to culture standards, which for a woman at that time was just sit at home and do nothing. She didn't do that either. She said, I'm not going to go by any label that anyone puts on me. I am going to do what God has called me to do. And so that is exactly what Priscilla does. She doesn't try to be better than anyone. She doesn't try to be less than anyone. She simply does what God has called her to do. We're done with questions now. Was she LGBTQ? No. No. Why would you ask that question? Because, I mean, okay. no. she doesn't know my label. Stop asking questions. Though. I literally okay, said okay, she's okay. married to her husband, Aquila, and you're just going past this to find 17 different questions. Save all the comments till the end, all right? All time. If they're helping build no, the church, they're not going to do that because it's definitely oh, yeah, it's, oh, yeah, is an oh, abomination yeah, oh, yeah. to God. There we go. There we go. Enoch's it. actually going to teach the rest of the message. So <laughs> those are the four books that we see them in. And Enax is the first one that we see Priscilla and Aquila mentioned and so if we know anything about the book of acts it's the beginning of what I'm looking at you because you just answered this question it is not the beginning of romans no no the church thank you it's the beginning of the church all four books that we see them in are paul building up the church no you didn't you said kings you, know? you went right back to the first bad answer the earlier answer is what i was looking for there elijah i'm sorry i'm dumb dumb picking on you the church, that is the very first place we see the church built up after Jesus ascends to heaven. That is the very first place is in the book of Acts. And so we see a lot of things beginning in Acts by implementing what God wants to do with the church. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite pastors, John Piper, he says this specifically about Acts chapter 2, where the church is originally being built up. And he's, he defines the church as this. He said, I would define a local church like this. A local church is a group of baptized believers who meet regularly to worship God through Jesus Christ to be exhorted from the word of God and celebrate the Lord's Supper under guidance of duly appointed leaders. This is how John Piper, by looking solely at the book of Acts, would describe the body of Christ and would describe the church. And this is how he says it functions according to Acts chapter 2. But there's one point in this description that John mentions that I really want to focus on this morning. And it is right in the middle where he says they come to be exhorted through the word of God. Exhorted through the word of God. It is a local church of baptized believers, regularly worship God through Jesus Christ, but they are exhorted through the word of God. Now, who knows what the word exhort means? This is not even a Greek or Hebrew word. This is simply English. So who knows what exhort means? Does anyone know what that means? What does it mean to be exhorted by the word of God? Hmm? Is it used? Used? I mean, basically. Kind of. Not used, exactly. I mean, basically the same, be used by the word of God. Be used by, no. It's not used. Like to Exposed? You're, you're getting closer. Um, I know what word you want to say. I know what word is. I'll tip my tongue. Is that I got this. I got this definition straight out of the dictionary. So I don't know if this would be something that I would say. Oh, really? You, you need a dictionary term for this, this bro. I'm about to look it up. Like I got it real quick. 
Who knows? What do you think exhort means? Jacob, shot in the dark. <laughs> no dang idea. Exhort simply means to urge, advise, or warn earnestly. And so literally what the book of Acts does, and you'll see this if you read the book of Acts, is the teachers in the church, they advise and urge and warn people through the word of God. That is their job as the church. It is our job to teach you what this book says so that you may be warned, urged, and advised all throughout your life on what it is that God wants you to do with your lives. And if you look at the book of Acts, you will see that all the way throughout this book, that the building up of the church relies on teaching people the word of God. Now, if you told me this now, that is very dumbed down and pretty much the most self-explanatory thing I've ever heard, because I'd be like, of course that's the job of the church. What else would be the job of the church than to teach the Bible? That seems pretty self-explanatory. But if you told me this as a kid, I might also be like, oh yeah, that's one of the functions of the church. Because if there's anything you may know about the church in this nation, sadly, teaching the Bible is becoming less and less of a priority as the church. It might be one of the priorities as the church, but as a kid, I went to multiple churches where I can tell you teaching the Bible was a means to do something even better. Meaning that a lot of people and a lot of churches like to think that the biggest goal of the church is to reach as many people as they possibly can and bring in as many people through their doors as they can. Some churches don't even want to teach the Bible in depth because they think it will affect the people who therefore come in. So they'll be saying, let's not teach this passage or let's not teach this because it might offend people. So let's just make it our goal to bring in as many people as we can and teach the fun verses and then we'll let God figure out how to communicate the rest of the Bible to them. That is something called a seeker-sensitive movement that is definitely thriving in America these days. And while I hope none of you have been to these churches, if you have, you know exactly what I am talking about. There are many churches that are afraid to teach some specific things in the Bible simply because they don't want to affect the attendance or don't want to affect the crowd coming in through the doors. And whether you have experienced this type of church method or not, what matters is that we see why this isn't a proper way to do church. And not only is this not a proper way to do church, this is why the book of Acts was written, because it shows us a different way that we should do church. And that different way is the way that God intends through the book of Acts. And so the first passage we have this morning is out of Acts chapter 2, and this is what we see as a very, very fine definition of what the purpose of the church should be. This is what Acts, 40, this is what Acts 2 verse 42 says. It says, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So this is written right after we see the beginning of the church take place. And right here we see the main thing that the body of Christ is dedicating themselves to in order to be the church that God has called them to be. These here are the four simplest things that we see the church must be devoted to if they want to be a biblical church. And what is the first thing that is mentioned in this list that the church must be devoted to? Teaching of <coughs> who's teaching? The apostles. What do you think the apostles are teaching? Hey, there we go. The word. That's literally what it is. It is to be exposed to the word. They're supposed to be dedicated to the apostles' teaching of the Bible. Quite literally, the church cannot function and it cannot continue to grow how God intended it to if we do not continually devote ourselves to the teaching of the word of God. If it is not a church's goal to grow you in the knowledge of the Bible, dare I say they are not being a biblical church. It should be every church's goal who identifies as Christian to teach you what this book says. And so that is the point. And I want to ask you this morning, if you were to ask yourself, what is the biggest thing that I'm looking for in a church, where would you personally rank sound biblical teaching. Right. Where would you personally rank it? Sound biblical teaching. If you were to ask yourself that, where do you think that would be on your list? If you were to ask our nation this question, where do you think America would rank sound biblical teaching that they would want in a church before they go? Where would that rank? At the bottom? I agree with that. 
there might be a few that would rank it in the top five, but I don't know if a lot of people would say that's the top, which is why even when we asked this question last week in small group, we literally had some students say, I wish the church was better at entertaining people. And I wasn't even mad at that answer because of how accustomed this nation has been at showing you it is the church's job to entertain you, make sure you have a great job, make sure you feel loved despite whatever you're doing, and the Bible comes secondary. That is not the goal. It is the goal to go to a church that has sound biblical teaching. And so I agree with you that if we asked our nation, where do you think biblical teaching would rank in order for people to go to church, I'm pretty sure it would be towards the bottom. And so if we think about it, when was the last time you actually heard pastors bragging about someone in their church understanding the Bible in a new way? Not very, you don't hear a lot of pastors go, I had an amazing Sunday because there was this one person who didn't understand what this passage meant. And when we taught it, and when the Holy Spirit spoke through me, they understood what the Word of God meant. You don't hear many of those stories. You know what stories you hear a lot of? Man, I had three, four, five hundred people come through my doors this week and praise God for it. And again, I want to reiterate, I am not shaming churches that have a lot of people that go to them. The question is, why are they going to the church? Do we have peoples flooding the doors of churches simply because they're entertained, simply because they hear a watered-down message from the Bible, or do we have people running into churches because they want to hear sound biblical teaching? That is the question we must ask. Is the body of Christ growing because of a strong teaching of the Word of God, or is it growing because of something else? And the book of Acts would clearly teach the former. The book of Acts will clearly teach the first that the church should solely grow because we are dedicated to learning to what this book says. So the second passage that we have is right in the middle of the book of Acts. And here is where Paul is on one of his missionary journeys with a man named Barnabas. Has anyone ever heard that name in the Bible? Now, I haven't seen you have to know where he is if you ever heard that name. Yeah, there we go. We got some people know who Barnabas is. Barnabas is mentioned in the Bible as another helper with Paul, and they are teaching the Gospels to the Gentiles. And listen specifically to what Paul does and what it says here. Acts 13, 44 through 46. It says this. It says, The next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you repudiate it and judge for yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are therefore turning to the Gentiles. For you, if you don't know what Paul is basically saying here, he is telling the Jews who are jealous that the Gentiles get to hear the gospel. He's basically saying, Why are you upset that other people are hearing the good news of God? And to put it selfishly, the Jews are upset because God chose for the way of salvation to come through the Israelites. If you've never read the Old Testament, Jesus came through the Israelites. He came from a specific people group through a specific lineage of people. And they're upset because they're saying Jesus is the Jewish Savior, but he can't be anyone else's. And so that is beyond selfish, quite possibly one of the most selfish things in the world you could say, because what you're literally saying as a nation and as a culture and group of people is we don't want to share eternal life with other people. We have the answer, and we want everyone else to go to hell. That's quite literally the stubbornness of heart that these Jews have. Why do the Gentiles get to hear this word? We are the only ones who want to receive this word. But I don't want you to focus on how Paul even addresses this crowd, because all of us hopefully know that is definitely wrong. Everyone should be able to hear the gospel and be invited to the kingdom of God. I want you to focus on what the beginning of this passage tells us, because what does it say is the main reason these groups gather? What does the very first verse say? The next day on the Sabbath, the whole city assembled to what? To hear, the word. hear the word of God. To hear the word of the Lord is quite literally what it says. Now, it doesn't say that the Jews gathered for this, and then when Gentiles randomly showed up, then they got offended. No, it says the whole city gathered to hear this news. The whole city gathered. So the Gentiles, probably knowing 
good and well, we are going to be hated, we are going to be judged, and probably beat up a bit for going to this message. But if this message is true, if this is truly the key to eternal life, we will stop at nothing to hear. We will stop at nothing to hear. This group of people definitely knew that they were going to be hated and judged for what they were about to do, and they went to go hear it anyway. And this makes a lot of people in this world, in this day and age, specifically in our nation, look terrible. Because we have a lot of people who aren't even willing to get out of bed to go to church, let alone be hated, judged, and almost beat for this word. We have a lot of people not like it. As a matter of fact, the NCF, which is the National Christian Foundation, did a study of believers, and I do quotes like that because I don't know if these are real believers or not. This is just a study of people who say they call themselves Christian. They did a study and said, what is the number one reason you guys don't go to church? They spoke to a ton of Christians who said, I don't go to church, and they asked, what is the number one reason you don't go to church? And 40% of Christians had the exact same answer. Does anyone have a shot in the dark what you think that answer is? Huh? You don't want to wake up for it? That's what I thought it would be. It's not that. They don't feel like it. Now we're getting blander. That's close. That actually, it's close. Tired? It's almost worse than all of that. It's too early. Lazy? Lazy? I agree with you. They're definitely lazy. That is not the answer. <laughs> I have a lot to do. I have a lot to do. Not that. Oh, God. Because they don't have society shaming the Christians. Society shaming the Christians? I don't need to go to church. That's really close. The number one reason 40% of Christians don't go to church who say they don't practice their faith in the church is because they say they can practice their faith in other ways. Literally saying, I don't need to go to church. I know God tells me in the Bible that that is exactly what he wants believers to do, but the number one reason is because they say they can practice their faith in other ways. These Gentiles literally were willing to be hated and judged over the Bible, and meanwhile, we have people nowadays just saying, I can figure out the truth on my own time. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to hear someone who has a background in teaching the Word of God. I don't need to hear someone who has education in teaching the Word of God. I can figure out what it means on my own time and practice my faith in any other way besides going to church. Heck, we have people in this room who would probably be willing to admit they haven't gone to church once in the last month or so simply because they didn't want to wake up. But there are multiple people that we can see in the Bible go through multiple sufferings, multiple judgments, and multiple hardships solely to hear the good news of God. And if there is anything that the Gentiles can teach us in the midst of this hate from the Jewish community, it is that the true church, the true church will stop at nothing to learn about the Bible. The true church will stop at nothing to learn about the word of God. If they are truly led by the spirit of God and they have truly been saved, they will stop at nothing to learn about the word of God. That is a top priority, hands down, when deciding what church to attend. Because this is the church that God wants to build. This was the church that God was building through people like Paul and Priscilla in the book of Acts. And as we continue on and we look on to our last passage here at the end of the book of Acts, we see Paul goes on his third missionary journey and he comes across a man named Apollos. Now this guy, I don't know if we've heard of before. Anyone heard of Apollos before? He is not that famous, but he comes in a very crucial and critical time here in the book of Acts. So Acts 18, 24 through 26 is where we see Apollos and this is what it says. It says, Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian, by birth an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John, and he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And so here we see this man, Apollos, who clearly believes in what Paul is teaching. That is why he is trying to reciprocate it and teach it himself. He clearly believes 
what Paul is teaching through the Word of God. But when Priscilla and Aquila hear what he is saying, they learn that he doesn't fully understand what he is teaching. They're saying you're getting a lot of things right, but there's a little thing and they don't explain what it is, but there's something in your teaching that doesn't line up exactly with what the Bible says. And so they pulled them aside and said, this is what you need to know. This is what the Bible really says about this, and you should start teaching this way. This is what these two do. And so what do they do literally at the end? It says they made the word of God more accurate to him by explaining it to him. They made the word of God more accurate and explained the Bible to this man. Now, let me ask you a question. Throughout this entire passage, how many times do we see Paul mentioned? Zero? You're correct. It's zero. Zero times. Zero times is Paul mentioned in this entire passage. So, who taught the word of God to this man if Paul is not mentioned? Priscilla. Priscilla. Priscilla and Aquila taught the word of God to this man. And why do you think they were able to teach this man the Bible? If these were just random tent makers who have never heard the word of God before, why were they able to teach the Bible to him? God spoke to him. That's a good answer. Who taught the Bible to them? Paul. Paul did. And he didn't just teach them one part of the gospel. He didn't just teach them one part of the Bible. He taught to them the word of God because they sat under the biblical teaching themselves. They were therefore able to go and teach it to somebody else. And this is a great reason why teaching the word of God is a must for the body of Christ because Priscilla and Aquila did not just hear this man's teaching and say, wait here until I get Paul and he'll explain to you what this means. They didn't say, just wait till Sunday where you can hear a real biblical message spoken by Paul, and then you'll understand how to teach the Bible more accurately. They literally said, because I know the truth, and because the truth has been taught to me, now therefore I can share it with you. That is the goal of the church. And think about it for a second. Who can reach more people? A large group of believers who know the truth and can take the truth with them outside of the church 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or one man who can teach one gospel message for one hour a week by himself. The group of believers. Clearly, it is the first one. More people can reach the lost if we teach them what this Bible means. So instead of just teaching the same thing week after week, as true as it may be, more people, if we teach to them what's in this book, are going to be able to go out and make disciples and reach people for Jesus than one man ever could. I don't care how big your church is. I don't care how many people you can fit in one service. You can reach so many more people if the body of believers know the Bible and they can go reach people as opposed to you saying, let me figure out one hour in a week where I can bring as many lost people in as I can. You can reach vastly far more people if the body knows how to reach the lost. And so this is the goal of the church. It is not to build up a huge audience inside. It is to go and make multiple disciples outside. And the reason we are willing and able to do that is if we know what the Bible says. Listen to what Warren Wiersbe says about this in the church, about the Church of Acts. He says, the believers continue to use the temple for their place of assembly and ministry, but they also met in various homes. The new converts needed instruction in the word and fellowship with God's people if they were to grow and become effective witnesses. The early church did more than make converts. They also made disciples. That is the goal of the church. Friends, if you hear anything else today, hear this, that the goal of the church is to teach the word to disciples who will one day make disciples. That is the purpose of the church. It is to teach the Bible, to teach the word of God to believers in Christ who will be disciples to other people so that they may one day be disciples of Jesus as well. It is not to just give them a little bit of milk, tell them they're saved, give them no instruction on how to read the Bible, and then say, well, if you're lost, just come to this guy because I know he can tell you the Bible. No. It is one day to be able to say, I know what the Bible says because I have been taught it, 
and therefore I can help lead you in the Word of God myself. And this is essentially the challenge and the goal that we need to live out. And it's also what I want to challenge and encourage you with as we leave this morning. Because I want you to ask yourself personally, if someone came up to you right now and asked you, how am I supposed to be saved? Would you know how to answer this person? Specifically, if someone said, can you teach me how to be saved? I believe I'm going to hell. I believe I don't know the way to salvation with God. Can you teach me how to be saved? Do you know how you would personally answer that question? Because depending on whatever your answer may be, what's ironic is the goal is still the same. Because the goal is to remain under biblical teaching. If you don't know how to lead someone to Christ right now, that's fine. You know how you will? Remain under biblical teaching. If you do know how to lead someone to Christ, that's amazing. I guarantee you, harder questions will come. You know how to answer those ones? Remain under biblical teaching. That is one of the biggest goals of the church. No matter how advanced we are in our knowledge of the Bible, or how non-advanced we are in our knowledge of the Bible, the goal should be for each and every single person in this room and each and every single person that goes to church to remain under sound biblical teaching. Because I'm willing to bet we could all afford to grow in our knowledge of the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. I guarantee that because we have had some games in here that have proven you all really need to grow in the knowledge of the Word of God, and it shows, all right? So make sure that is a priority and a goal of ours this week, all right? Let's pray, then we'll hang out and play some games until main service is done this morning. God, we come before you, and we thank you for your Word, and we thank you for characters in your Word, like Priscilla, who teach us amazing things, even though they may be mentioned so little times. God, I thank you for her faithfulness, God, for her commitment to not just help Paul, but God, for her commitment to be who you have called her to be, nothing more and nothing less. That God, through her works and through her helping with Paul, she has been able to help lead the church, she has been able to help shape the church, and at the end of the day, God, she has been able to be a vital piece to show us what the body of Christ should look like in this day and age. And God, I pray as we continue to read your word, as we continue to study these passages, and as we continue to study the life of Priscilla, God, we pray that you would just continue to open our eyes as to what you want us to be and who you have called us to be so that we may fulfill the will that you have called your church to fulfill. God, help us to be the body of Christ that shows Jesus to other people even when we may be failing at it ourselves. So God, this week as we all go about our ways, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be leading us Holy Spirit, be guiding us and be showing us how we can be who you have called us to be so that we may hold on to sound biblical teaching no matter what church we one day may go to, no matter what pastors and what teachings we may come across one day. I pray that we wouldn't just be people who invite people to church, although that is an amazing win. I pray that we would be people who can bring the word of God to them. God, help us be people who can teach the word of God to others. Help us be people who can make disciples who also one day make disciples. God, we love you. We praise you. Help us grow in our knowledge of the word of God this week. And it's in your name we pray.